So welcome to class. We are starting the lesson at the end of the lesson, but you know, whatever, because I forgot to press record. So I'm going to go with the introduction of today's lesson, right? Which is going to be uh, taught by Jachen, right? Uh, our students um, with me and, and Jan. And what is he going to be talking about, right? So we've been talking about um, EBMs, right? A lot in this class, because of course, uh, you know, we like EBMs, right? Jan likes EBMs, so we do like EBMs as well. And so let me give you a small recap of why and how these things come together. So there are two major types of architectures. Uh, the one that you have seen with me in the last few lessons were the first one, the latent variable generative energy-based models or LVGE EBM, right? Or the second one, which is going to be the joint embedding methods, right? So let me show you what are the differences or similarities. So we start with the latent variable generative EBM, right? We have a X and there is a dot. You asked me before, why is it dot? Dot is a point, right? So I have one point. Then I have some encoder and predictor, whatever. I'm going to have my hidden representation in green. I have also a dot, right? The H goes inside a decoder. And the decoder is also fed with a source of variability. They're represented with a straight line, right? So Z, a input, a latent input, missing input, can vary along that line. H is going to be just a specific, you know, value, vector, point, whatever. Therefore, uh, we also need to add a regularization term, right? Why do we need a regularization term on the latent? Because otherwise, the latent becomes too much, too powerful, and then the overall model is going to be assigning zero energy to all the possible uh, values, right? So that's going to be a collapse model. So we had the decoder now generates my Y tilde, right? The Y tilde varies around, you know, a manifold. How do we introduce this variation by having that Z that is moving along a line, right? And so this Y tilde now can move around as well, whereas H basically tells you what is uh, maybe the size of that ellipse, for example, right? Then, as I asked you before, where, since we have a white tilde, I don't know how, how many people, there are some people with us, right? So you can still type in the chat if you feel like uh, <laughs> joining the, the, the lesson, right? I, still. So we have this white tilde, right? My prediction, how do we, what do we miss, right? We need to add a spring, right? The spring allows me to get my prediction not to fly away from my target, right? So I have a target on the bottom, which is also varying, for example, uh, around this manifold, this elliptical manifold. And then I have a spring in between the C term, okay? Then I ask you before, what is the energy of the system, right? And the energy is going to be the summation of all these red boxes. In this case, I'm going to have this E, right? Function of X, Y, and Z which is going to be the sum of the C term, distance between my prediction and my target, and the regularization term R, okay? So these are the generative models. Why are they called generative? Because there is a Y tilde. I generate a, you know, estimate for my target, global Y. And I show you three types. I show you, uh, yesterday I show you the uh, architectural type, right? That was the, uh, like, under complete hidden layer for the autoencoder. Then I show you the contrastive type, which was the uh, denoising autoencoder, where we take a sample, we displace it, and we enforce a high energy equal to the square distance of the displacement. Then there was the third technique, which was the regularized technique, which was the variation autoencoder, where we automatically assign high energy for things that are not observed. On the right hand side, I'm going to be introducing today topic of the lesson, the joint embedding method where we start with a point, the X, I'm going to have the encoder, I have the projector, whatever, I'm going to have this E I use for embedding, which is the same as H, maybe I should have called it uh, H, um, for the embedding for the X, so it's still a point. On the right hand side, I have my Y that is moving around manifolds, the encoder perhaps just, you know, unwarps this manifold and I have it just moving in a linear fashion. And then I may have the projector, which is collapsing that variability once again into one point. So this right hand side column basically has inbuilt an invariance for variations done on the manifold, right? So all the manifold variations, so the, the Y has some degrees of freedom. 
these degrees of freedom that are constrained on the manifold are eaten away by the right column, right? So you have with two stages, we unwarp this uh, elliptical shape into a line, and then the line is going to be condensed down to one point. Finally, I'm going to have my uh, cost term, right? My energy term. And then final, the, finally, the free energy is free because there are no latent. So this F is going to be this big box, which is comprising just the C term. And so we have that the F, free energy, energy of the system, X and Y, is going to be this cost between the two embeddings, the EX and the EY, right? Then I told you um, just before starting the lesson that there are different types of training procedure, right? We mentioned that we have contrastive methods, which are like the denoising autoencoder, where you choose uh, points that need to have high energy. And then on the other side, you have the architectural and the regularized. So architectural were the one that you implicitly, ch by choosing a some, you know, making some choices from the architecture, you automatically constrain the amount of uh, low energy that you can give and they regularize that you basically add a penalty, right? For not giving, uh, for giving low energy to too many things, right? And then I show you very quickly, but then it was not a major thing. The, uh, what are these two options, right? So we had a contrastive, for example, we either push up everywhere or we push up at specific locations, or we go off manifold to on manifold, like yesterday's, uh, so like the denoise not encoder. And on the right hand side, we have the architectural and uh, regularized techniques. For example, we put a upper bound uh, for the low energy volume, or either we use a regularization term, or we minimize the gradient and then maximizing the curling factor. Okay, and so that was all I wanted to say. Uh, before starting today's lesson, which is about joint embedding methods, GEMS, right? Which you have going to be hearing about. Well, if you have watched the recording, you already heard. But anyway, you can listen to this beforehand. You're going to be hearing about contrastive, clustering, dis distillation, and information maximization. We, we usually call it a visual representation learning. Basically, it means visual means we only care about images or videos. We don't care about natural language or speech. So the like in general there's a two type of method you can do like uh, for under the visual representation learning you can either do supervised or you can do self supervised or unsupervised in the case of supervised the visual representation learning a lot of people call it the transfer learning so basically you super you you train your model on some like a supervised data set then you try to transfer some uh, out of a distribution data set and check the performance but uh, today, our focus will on be on the self-supervised side. So in general, we kind of have like three categories of method, the generative models and the pretext task and the joint embedding method. For the self-supervised uh, visual representation learning, really, you have a two, step, uh, two steps of like what you do. The first step is like per training. So the idea is you use a really large amount of label data to train a backbone network. And so different methods will produce a, produce a backbone network differently. So you will get this thing, like it's an encoder or it's a backbone network. So you get an image and you can generate some representation about the image. Then the second step is about the evaluation. So here, then you can use a small amount of label data to train a downstream task head network. So so there's two ways you can do it. One way we call it feature extraction. You get the image, you go through the encoder, you generate representation. Then you use the representation to uh, train a downstream uh, like a test head. Like a, for give you an example, if you, you can, if you have the encoder, you can make all the image become vector. Then you can, you, like you can even do some reinforcement learning stuff on you. You can attach a reinforcement learning like a, a text head on top of it, so then you can just do reinforcement learning on the representation space instead of the image space. Okay, there's a, so the only difference between feature extraction and the fine tuning is whether you cut the gradient. What is it because whether in the, in the fine tuning, you actually change the encoder, but for feature extraction, you don't change the encoder. So that's a difference. So mainly for all the different methods, it's only the pre-training step it's a it's a different like the evaluation step. There's some like some standard way you can evaluate, so make it a fair comparison between different methods. Okay, so we let's talk about the other two methods first. So like for generative models, 
like one of the really famous ones, like uh, the autoencoder, right? So you just get an image. Let's say it's an image here, and you like uh, for for the case of denoising autoencoder, you get the uh, like original image. You get some noise, and uh, then you try to use encoder decoder to reconstruct the original image. So then. In the end, you just took it after after you pre-training the networks. Then in the end, you just uh, discard the decoder, only keep the encoder, and for the down, uh, as you, as is the backbone, then you can use for other tasks. Okay. So then there's another category called pretext uh, pretext tasks. So then it's uh, almost the same, but you get the image, you go through encoder, but here you figure out some smart way to generate some like a sudo pseudo like labels give you an example like uh, this one is an image of a tiger so you pick nine patches from the images so then this this b like the nine different patches you shuffle it and that's your input x so what the output y is uh, the correct way to label them so that's uh, your y so you train your network to basically uh, try to rearrange those patches and make sure they make sense so it, 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 like, it, like let's see in this case, it's actually if uh, the network can successfully rearrange the patches, it means, must mean it's understand the image. So it means the representation like, uh, means something. So those methods, those two methods are quite popular, like uh, between 2014 or 2018 or 19 even. So, but uh, then like this uh, joint embedding method came out. So then like it's basically dominant the self-supervised representation representation learning, like failed. What is the major issue with the previous uh, type of architecture with a pretext task? Okay, in the pretext task, like, uh, the, like uh, the issue usually be how you design your pretext task. So you pre if you design your pretext task too easy, so the network won't learn really good representation. But if you design it really hard, maybe it's even harder than your downstream task. So the network is, doesn't really train very well. So then your downstream time suffered. So, so it's like really hard to, to come up with a good design for the pretext task. The representation yeah. will basically uh, be yeah. tailored to the specific task we are going to be yeah. training, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's also another issue, yeah. So yeah. the loss here is just classification for this case? Yeah, here is just a classification. Also in the previous one, generative models, what is the major issue there, right? Why don't we use generative okay. models? So, okay, there's a, the major issue for autoencoder is this. So it's you need this decoder. So first of all, training a decoder is already really hard. Like if you have a bad decoder, you need you, you will get a bad encoder. So also it's a try to solve a, so it's a trying to also it's trying to solve a problem is a too sometimes too hard, and uh, why is that? Yeah. Why is it hard to decode? Right? Why is it hard? Yeah, because uh, your representation is not necessary. You don't for your, for a lot of your downstream tasks, you don't really have to like the representation not necessary have to be reconstruct. Let's say you have a two image of a two dogs. So if you just want to do classification, your representation doesn't have to be able to. Like uh, it could uh, like project to the same uh, representation, right? The two dogs have the same representation, means they're just dogs. But if you want to reconstruction, so those two dogs, they actually should have, a, they cannot be the same representation. So that makes the, yeah, that's, a, that's actually harder compared to you can just uh, squeeze uh, the representation space. Then the last thing is uh, sometimes, a lot, like it's the, for autoencoder, Maybe the loss function is not too good because the loss function is uh, uh, reconstruction loss, like sometimes a Euclidean distance. So in the image space, it's not a really good, uh, not a really good loss. You can imagine like a two image of dogs, and uh, I can like uh, I can find a, maybe an image of a cat, which is closer to one of the dog image, and uh, so which more than the other dog image. So in that case. It means that the Euclidean distance is not really good measurement in a lot of cases. So I think that's in general why the autoencoder is not a really good uh, representation learning method. So is this why variational import is important for making a good generative autoencoder method? 
uh, variational? No, variational, I, 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 variational I, encoder. I'm not. I, I don't think so because uh, okay, for the only reason you want to make it variational for making the H is sometimes you want to sample from H. Like if you want to, like for really basic uh, variational autoencoder, you want to the H to be Gaussian or something. That's because you want to sample from it. But uh, there's no reason for if I'm just doing downstream tasks, just a classification. I don't want. I don't really care about the, the whether the representation is uh, Gaussian or not. So it's really just add extra. Uh, if you use variation autoencoder to learn the representation, it's basically just add extra constraint to the representation. But you don't really care about the constraint. The following one, when the, you had classification over the nine yeah. uh, patches. So are we having like a soft arg max over nine categories here? Uh, I don't remember exactly how they do it, but uh, I think it's more than nine categories. Uh, so each yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think maybe, yeah, you're right. Maybe each patches have a nine different categories, but uh, you have to control it and make sure it doesn't, uh, all, all patches belong to the same category. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's all with okay. the question so far. Okay. So back to drawing batting. So yeah, the game, the whole idea is just to try to make your backbone network uh, robust to a certain distortion. Because uh, imagine if you downstream that classification and uh, you distort the image a little bit, the image still is a dog, right? You want to classify that as a cat or anything. So you should, it should robust to distortion. So here's uh, what you could do. So you get an image of dog and you get a two different distorted version of it. Then you encode it with your backbone network to, to representation and you want them to be close to each other. So, so like, a, so it means, it means, it means the two images share some semantic information. Okay. But then there's like a really, Bad thing happened is the trivial solution. Why? Because uh, actually the network could cheat. It doesn't have to generate, uh, uh, it doesn't have to just invariant to data mutation. It can invariant to the input. Basically, no matter what input you gave it to it, it generates the same output. Then the distance will be just zero. So in that case, uh, you, you got this trivial solution. So, so the whole issue, the whole way you want to do the join body method, different method is just how you prevent this trivial solution. So, so the general idea is instead of just care about the local the energy, like between you two pair of uh, distorted images, you actually, you actually get a, a batch of them, batch of the images, you get n pairs. And then you try to make sure the 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 collection of the representation, the hx. So, like for each image, you get h the lowercase hx. Then you collect n of them. So you you can you like make them uh, like a matrix. So it's like hx. You want this hx. So the trivial solution means all the h like a lo lowercase hx is the same. So then you just push this uh, uppercase hx to be like each column or each row to be different. So, so what then, is this plate notation with this capital N? Capital N, it means you get N of the same thing, but a different X and different Y. Okay, so inside the, the plate, we're gonna have the yeah. energy, is it? And then outside yeah. those green boxes loss are? The log, loss function. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so, it, uh, it, uh, yeah, the N just means you sample a bunch of images and uh, let's say you sample N images and uh, generate uh, N X and N of the Y, then you have uh, N, N of H X and N of uh, H Y. So then you concatenate them, not concatenate, maybe like a stack them. So you get the, the uppercase H X. So, so you, you try to make sure this H X have a certain property, like it cannot be all, con all the same, all the row are the same. So, right. So the, the loss is going to be acting on the batch, basically. Yeah, it will acting on the batch. Yeah. Whereas the energy, the, the D yeah. energy acts on the on individual, the sample. on yeah. the sample. I see, I see. Makes sense. In the sample. Yeah. Uh, can you please explain uh, once again, what is the small 
HX and the big HX? What are the difference between the okay. two? Okay. So the small HX is just a vector. It's a it's a, it's a, it is an embedding for one image. So the uppercase HX is a is a matrix. It it is a n, n times the dimension of HX, the lowercase HX. So n by d, d is the dimension of HX. So it means you just stack the n the batch all the all the batch embeddings together. So this this uppercase HX is a matrix n by d. You can think of that. And what is okay. a and b? A and B, yeah, A and B just uh, the loss functional. I, I will I will explain what what they are like for different method. Okay, for different uh, joint embedding method, uh, the the A and B means different things. Okay, so should I keep going? Yeah, I will just read okay. the equations as they come up. <laughs> okay, yeah. So and for so if you want to come up with your joint embedding method, so you have to change four things. Like there are four things you could change. The first is like a data augmentation. It's like a, how you generate this to a distorted version. Okay. Then the, the second one is the backbone network. What kind of backbone network you use? The third one is the energy function, like how you define the distance between the two representations. Then the last one is the logs functional, like how the A and B is. So we here today for today we just assume we have some reasonable data augmentation and uh, some reasonable backbone network like either ResNet or VIT or some like uh, new fancy stuff. But uh, the 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 re the, those two are actually super important. They're a like a like a lot of paper shows that if you change them, you you're like a like a, the good result, those are state of art result really put a lot energy ener like a engineering effort on the the data augmentation and backbone, but but there's actually not much theoretical understanding about why some backbone works, like why some backbone works, some backbone doesn't work, and uh, so it is still it's just a, a lot of just empirical knowledge. It's not really theoretical. So the only thing we kind of have a sort of good understanding is about the loss functional and the, the energy function. So for today, I mainly just talk about those two, and uh, we just assume we have a good data augmentation or good backbone network. Okay. So the two backbone networks have exactly the same weights. Then why not yeah. just put X and Y into the same backbone network? Okay. Yeah, you, you can do that, but uh, in the if you read the papers for drawing embedding, the people all draw like this. So. Yeah, like but sometimes like a like a yeah for for this particular case the two networks are the same so you can do that but sometimes they're not the same I will inter actually introduce a case when they're not the same and sometimes even they're same the the they may cut the gradient on the one side so I just draw it so like the the whole all the drawing are consistent with each other for the later growth okay. Sure, sure. Also, I think yeah. we have other diagrams where we use uh, this concept of parameter sharing, right? So we yeah. have maybe two encoders where the weights are the same, right? So yeah. for the sake of representation in uh, for the for understanding where the X goes and where the Y, we just replicate the symbol to make sure we yeah. understand uh, where they go. So there is another yeah. question. Oh, wait. Uh, hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what would the dot line between HX and capital HX represent what function do we apply it on HX to get the capital HX? And someone here is suggesting suggesting that is the stacking uh, operator. Yeah, yeah. So that's precisely it, right? So yeah, probably yeah, just stacking. Yeah. And then there is another question beside developed by Jan Lekan. Why gem is the method of choice? What is the evidence that uh, probes this method to be better than other? Uh, two methods and the other two methods being the generative methods and the um, yeah. the pretext pretext task right so why do we prefer uh, to 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 use these gems rather than the other yeah. one you introduced before okay the the simple solution is that they perform much better so like uh, no matter on uh, uh, if you downstream task classification like a uh, like no matter what your data set is use the the joint embedding method like a, all like a, for like a, there's a standard way you can measure it on the ImageNet, 
So those join embedding method are actually really close to supervised method. Let's say supervised can, in ResNet 50, on ImageNet, supervised can get 76, and the self super like join embedding method, maybe can get 75. But if you use a pre-text task or autoencoder, it, uh, it, it probably only get a 40 or 50 percent. So the, the, the performance gap is really large. I think that's the main reason why so many people like the method instead of the other two methods. And, and uh, yeah. Let's remind what are the major issues again. So the pretext, pretext task major issue it's, is the fact that. Yeah, it's really hard to design a good uh, pretext task. Whereas the generative right. approach major problem is that. Yeah. Uh, I would think it's the loss function, the reconstruction, or uh, the training of the of the, the yeah, generator, decoder, right? The, the tr yes, the training the decoder, of the decoder. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. that's I also just, a big problem. Yeah, yeah, I was just reminding. Uh, the, yeah, what are the major flaws, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. that's it. So okay, so then I will like uh, there's usually four category like uh, uh, for the drawing embedding method. Uh, you can do contrastive or non-contrastive or regularized, like a, like a young like to call it, or clustering method. And the first uh, category is like other method. We call it the other method because we do not quite understand why it works. So we just uh, <laughs> group them together, call them other method. Magic. But, yeah. Sorcery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, okay, let's start with the... Uh, okay, let, let's uh, talk a little bit about the all the 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 shared trait of all the drawing embedding method or the loss functions. So for the drawing embedding loss functions, you uh, you must have the two component. Like uh, it's like a term to push the positive pair closer. So usually that's just the energy function, right? You you push the energy function uh, lower. So in, essentially you make the two representation closer. Then or you, no, the second thing is you have to do a term to prevent the trivial solution, which is constant output. So basically, that's the A and the B in this graph. And uh, so how you do it, that actually differentiate a lot, uh, like a joint embedding method. And uh, I put in implicit here because uh, a lot of, of other method, they the those other methods they do not really have the explicit uh, loss term to prevent the, the trivial solution from happening and a lot of them actually can converge to a trivial solution but the during training it doesn't so so that's i well, that's why i put the implicit here but uh, in general you, you like for most of the function they have the loss function they have these two terms then another thing is uh here, like for the joint embedding method, it's kind of different from the supervised or the generative or anything because, like, one, one thing difference is because the loss function, the 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 loss, the, on, the in, only input to the loss function is the generated representation, is the output of your network. So, so in that case, it's different from supervised. Like supervised, you you get the, the you got you predict the label and you got actual label, but those actual label they are actually not uh, like they're fixed, so you cannot change the scale of it. Or like in the generate term, like the you try to reconstruct the image, the original image is also uh, fixed. But here you the scale here the loss function only take the two representations, so you can change the scale of the representation. Like you can multiply all of them by ten. If you multiply all of them by 10, let's say you multiply, let's say the you network produce all the representation of the HX and HY, but then you pr produce a 10 times larger. If you if you can produce a 10 times larger uh, representation and the loss function decrease, like the loss decrease, then in that case, you will the your training will be super unstable. So in general, those uh, joint embedding methods, they actually have a way to prevent this uh, unstable happen, unstableness happen. So I will, I will, I will show you guess what I mean later. Okay. Are the final embeddings specially insensitive? I mean, after 
different distortions, the X and the Y we feed in may just be different parts of a dog. So the yeah. features can be especially dissimilar, but the high level semantic information remain the same. Yeah, actually, that's a, like a really a lot of people currently working on that because uh, in the depends on data augmentation. But one of the really popular data augmentation, they people found out oh actually it only work very well for classification. Uh, like because like in the dog examples, see it just uh, it actually the representation ignores the special inf spatial information right because it's not really difference difference the two dogs right so so like uh, if you downstream classics object detection that's actually really bad so now a lot of people actually like research on that is to see. How the, the how to make the drawing embedding method? What kind of data augmentation is good for the drawing embedding method? Like uh, if the downstream class is a, is an object detection, and that's actually exactly what we're gonna do for your final, like you guys gonna do for your final computation is uh, try different ways to do to use SSL and try to do object detection. So try to keep the spatial information in the images as a as much as possible, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, like a, it's just, it's a still open challenge. But uh, for now, our understanding is uh, if you train with those kind of data augmentation, actually the 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 network has throw away a lot of spatial information about it. Yeah. So there is like a similar connection with the pretext pretext task and this yeah, data yeah. augmentation, right? Because yeah, it yeah. seems like the pretext task was giving us some parameters that are you know tailored to solve a specific you know made up task. Yeah. And here yeah, these yeah. joint embedding methods seems to be building invariance yeah. to the um, data augmentation yeah. that is kind of also tailored to the downstream task somehow, yeah. right? So I think there yeah, are yeah. some sort of Still limitations to be worked uh, around. So then let's uh, talk about the contrastive method. Okay, so actually the contrastive method now like it become really popular. Like a lot of people actually because this is so like a mostly early joint embedding method actually contrastive. So a lot of ac people actually call joint embedding method in general just call contrastive learning. Do we Although like contrastive methods or we don't like no, contrastive methods? We don't method. like contrastive methods. Why don't we like yeah. contrastive methods? Yeah, because the uh, contrastive method, you actually have to do e e either do sampling or do something to push the energy surface into spatial locations. So, so in that case, if you use space, is, uh, if you embed in space is uh, really large, you cannot uh, possibly push every possible locations. So you, it, it's much better to use some regularized method to make sure the volume of the low energy like uh, area is uh, small instead of use a contrastive learning method. I, actually, sorry, it's a push up the negative sample. You try to push up the negative sample. Yeah. So let, let's see here in the chat if students mm -hmm. are following. So yeah, what do contrastive okay. methods do? Okay. Type in the chat here, people. Yeah. And let's see if we are online. Okay. I mean, if we are, they push up energy, on mm -hmm. incorrect wise, right? But then the yeah. major issue is that that we have to. What's the major issue in the contrastive sample? Let's figure. We have to figure out where to find these wise, right? These specific samples, right? And so again, this yeah. is major issue. Rather than if we use these regularized techniques, we just you know handle many of them. It's the same problem we saw by the end of yesterday class, right? Whenever I try yeah. to uh, see the energy of the uh, linear interpolation of two inputs, the yeah. um, the regularized technique, right? The variational autoencoder was giving me a high energy for that kind of uh, linear interpolation of two input digits, whereas the denoising autoencoder, which is a um, contrastive technique, was giving a low energy on that uh, yeah. linear interpolation, right? Anyway, okay. let's get back to the slide and let's figure what are these I's and J's okay. and those things. Yeah, so again, as I mentioned, like uh, all the joint embedding uh, master have should have uh, two components like the loss functions. So the first one is to push the positive pair closer to each other. So you got a uh, one distorted dog image, another distorted dog image. 
you just push the representation of them closer to each other. Okay. So then you get the then, but to prevent the trivial solution, you actually push the negative pairs away. So if uh, if they actually from different images, so you x h x i and x x j, they means they're from uh, you get n of them, so they're from different. They generate from different images. So that could be a representation for a cat image and a, sorry, a representation of a dog image and the representation of cat images or a person or whatever other images. So you try to push the representation of those away. So then that essentially prevent the collapse. You, because the collapse means you output a constant uh, function, uh, constant vectors. So if you output a constant vector, not only the positive pair will be close, also the negative pair will be close to each other. So that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a basically the idea for contrastive learning, okay? What if so, all? What if the i and j are both dog images? They're even they're both dog images. You can you you still if but as long as they're from different dogs, they you may still want to push them away, like uh, because that uh, even they're same they're different. Okay, even they're both are dogs, it, they may still have some differences. So that shouldn't. Uh, you you just want all the positive pair like close to each other means the representation for the same dogs are close to each other but the representation from different dogs should uh, far should still far away from the image from the same dogs but uh, it should be closer to the a cat image let's say or a person or a car or tr a truck or something a bus right so okay so actually, the contrastive learning method actually introduced, uh, like uh, at the Young's group, like uh, it's like 2005 or 2006. It uh, introduced this contrastive learning method, but that at that time it doesn't work very well. Or if it works, it only works on a simple, really simple data set. Okay. The the issue here is uh, actually for all the contrastive learning method is really how to find a good negative pairs. I see here if uh, all my negative pairs always a cat and uh, I see uh, uh, it, it, yeah like see if uh, all my negative samples are always a cat and uh, I don't know like a, a classroom I say a cat and uh, sorry it's a dog and a classroom so the network will be super easy to find out oh like the the, the two things are different it doesn't have to learn the full representation about the dogs. Is it just a need to know? Okay, this dog have a certain. Let's say it have some certain texture of the skin of the dog. So it and the the classroom like a lighting kind of different. So it can cheat on the on like a like a for the training. So the really really issue is how to find the good negative pairs. You actually want to find the find the dogs and another dogs. They look similar, but they're different dogs. So then you push the network to learn good representation. And, and uh, most of the early attempts is to do some called hard negative mining. So you have some prior knowledge about the images, about the data you have. So every time you try to sample some negative that is super close to the uh, your original image. So like, a, like a, it's actually used a lot in the facial recognition. So people try to use some prior knowledge to find the people who have similar faces, but a different person have similar faces, then you use those images as negative samples and use the person, the same person's image as the positive pairs. But in general, it doesn't quite, doesn't quite work well, doesn't work very well. So then, but then it's a, it says it's like 2005, 2006, then it came to 2000, 20, and when this uh, two paper came out, so called simply and Moco, and how they solve the issue with good negative pairs, they are actually just using really large batch size. If you sample a lot, a lot of negative images, you will get some good negative, uh, negative samples. So that's how they solve the issue with the, like uh, from the good negative pairs. So many, many questions here. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can we adjust how much we push based on the negative sample? 
so if it's different dog or different cat, mm -hmm. so how, how, how can we, can, yeah, can we, can we push with different, uh, intensity based on the content of the image, right? So I think yeah. the, the question is like, can we push differently based on the label associated to the image? But I think this is without yeah. labels, right? So yeah, you don't even know what's the label of the images. That, that's a, that's an issue here, right? Unless, because you don't know that's an image of dog or image of cat. Unless we are the one which are generating the data yeah, set, yeah. right? So if yeah. we are taking pictures of my own dog and you take your pictures yeah. of your own dogs, then, then we can actually have that, right? But usually we just have this huge collection of unlabeled yeah. images yeah. and we have to basically build a representation that is somehow not collapsing down into a single point. Mm -hmm. And it is like, you know, descriptive enough to inc yeah. include all those different things. Right. Okay. Yeah. So any other question? Yeah. Uh, then there were people answering the, the yeah, question okay. in chat, but I, I think okay. it's, it's nice to have the question, uh, to, to read out loud the question yeah. such that we had in, in the, in the recording. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the boss, uh, same clear Moco, they're using some loss function shall inference AE and the loss function is actually pretty proposed pretty early. Like, uh, there's a, uh, 2014 paper. I think that's a 2000, uh, sorry, 2004 papers, like actually already proposed this loss function. And, uh, so, but it's uh, never really worked very well until we have enough compute to really able to use a larger batch size. And then 2020, we, uh, at early 2020, we get this two like amazing papers and uh, use this inference AE loss to do the contrastive learning. So next I will like explain what the inference AE loss function is. And uh, yeah, so you will see how they do that. And uh, also it's kind of related to the questions like how can we give a different weight to different uh, negative samples? And uh, the inference AE actually do that and they do it really smartly, okay? So this is the loss function, okay? So you get the positive pair of X and Y. So you took the negative log of the exponential of the beta is like a hyperparameter of a similarity between your positive pair, okay? The similarity between your positive pair. Then you divide by the sum of the similarity between all the negative pairs. So the HX and HXJ. J just not uh, mean, means the image, the representation from other images and uh, this one. So why it makes sense? We can re, like reformulate it. So you put the log inside and uh, cancel the log and exponential cancel. So the first term is minus beta, uh, the HX and HY, the similarity between the positive pairs, plus this log whole thing. And, uh, Magically, not magically, it's a do it on purpose, but uh, you get the log, some x. So that's, a, that's a, what we call in this class the softmax, or some people call it the real softmax. So you get the negative beta, like a sim, uh, similarity between the positive pair and the softmax between all the negative pairs. So because this, this, loss, uh, this is a loss function, so you want to you want to minimize this. So a beta is positive, right? So you want to minimize this, uh, you, make, you try to push this term high. You, push the, you basically push the similarity between the positive pair high. And then you do a softmax on the, all the negative pair and you push the similarity between the negative low, but with a different force, right? Because uh, you try to push the, 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 the negative pair have a high similarity, much harder than the pair, neck to pair with low similarity because there's a softmax, okay? So, so in this case, you basically do, you basically like a, you basically do the two things, push the positive pair closer to each other, neck to pair away from each other. And uh, as I said, you always have something to, you need to do something to prevent the, the gradient explosion. So the particular similarity measurement like uh, people chose is this one the inner basically the inner product between the two the representation and uh, so you because you normalize the, the the norm so you vector even you vector grew really long you can still 
make sure them like a, the they, they they're like a union the vector. Make sure you normalize to the union vector. So that's the, the loss function of inference AE. I think it's uh, intuitively makes a lot of sense. Uh, any question, Alfredo? Yes, there is a there. There is one long question. I'm not sure if I just read it. I, I let's see what is, what's going on. Okay. Oh, the second one. Okay, sure. So this architecture should be really useful in uh, imitation learning. Then, because you have control over what samples you have. Yeah. Uh, imitation learning. You mean? I don't know. Uh, uh, let's I see. actually don't know. I actually, I'm not sure. I, uh, I think uh, RL people really like the self-supervised learning method, but uh, I'm not really sure about the imitation learning. Yeah. Okay. Maybe Victor so, can send some more. Uh, yeah. Arif. yeah. Like you have demonstration pairs. So X and Y's would be demonstration pairs. Is it what you're saying, right? Um, yeah. So if mm -hmm. X and Y's are demonstration pair to yeah. have basically uh, to get their representation close together, I'm not entirely sure. I okay. So Victor, try to write a more uh, <laughs> a new question so that we understand better what yeah. you're trying to ask. Yeah. Then I will ask the question. Okay. Uh, I, I want to add this uh, for imitation learning. It's a kind of like a how we evaluate, right? You when you do the pre-training step, you you don't really care about the, like, a, no, no, you care about what downstream class you use, but uh, that's a, that's a usually not to, we not directly do imitation learning when we do the pre-training steps. Yeah. Okay. So should I go? Yes, yes. So, I will read okay. the question whenever it comes up, a okay. uh, new question. <laughs> the difference between the sim clear and the, the MoCo, it's how we really going to do about this large batch size. Okay, so what the uh, same clear did is we just brute forcely increase the batch size. Actually, the batch size they use in the paper, like it's 8,000, uh, about, uh, about uh, like 8,200. So that's huge. If you know, like for at that time for supervised learning, people usually the common batch size is like a 256 or 128. So if you batch size is 8,000, that's actually really large. And uh, uh, like uh, even in 2020, I think uh, when the paper came out, people are actually really surprised. And uh, they talk about, oh, it's going to cost like uh, $100,000 on like a Google Cloud or something to train it. So it's like really surprising for a lot of people. Uh, so, and, uh, so that's how you use it, how the same clear, like you make sure, like uh, utilize a large batch size. However, there's a MoCo use, a, I think, a more clever way. And uh, so that's also, it's also a really old idea, but the idea is to use a memory bank. Okay. So the idea is you use smaller batch size. Like let's say here, N is like a 200 or just a 128, 256 or something. Smaller batch size, but uh, instead of uh, just using the the HY from just one negative, like uh, for when you for the like for the positive, you always keep the same thing, right? But for the negative, you you want a large batch size. How you manually do that? So. You just you not do not uh, you do not just care about the current batch negative samples. You also get all the most of the previous steps, the recent uh, previous steps and uh, samples, and then you put them together to aggregate this uh, like a uh, amount of negative samples. So let's say if you n is uh, two hundred fifty six, and uh, you could uh, let's say if you aggregate all the previous 32 steps, 32 batches of negative samples, you essentially have a thousand, uh, a thousand batch, like a negative, a thousand number of negative samples. So that's really clever because it saves a lot of space, the, like, uh, the space of uh, like uh, the memory. And, uh, so you also utilize it because you don't have, have a, you don't have to generate uh, again, right? Because you can just save it into, a memory bank. However, there's an issue with that. The issue is because B is updated every step, the backbone is actually updated every step. So 
after a while, you owe the you owe the negative samples are not that valid anymore because uh, the 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 backbone here and the backbone here maybe already really different. So their representation are really different. So if you do contrastive learning on that, you will see a clear like a de- like a decrease of your performance. So the MoCo why like uh, the MoCo actually means momentum contrast. It's actually they use something called momentum batch uh, like a backbone. So the idea is actually you slow down the training of those uh, this uh, uh, this right backbone. So you make them update much slower. So in that case, the difference between the old momentum backbone and the new momentum backbone is not that different. So it means those uh, negative samples are still valid, even you train already trained a while. Okay. So is there a stop gradient missing from that uh, top horizontal oh, right. line? Sorry. Yeah, there's a stop gradient here. So you uh, do on not the top right. only back pop top right. Yeah. Okay, it's actually here. Actually, you do not update the, anything at all, right? So, how you do it? So here's uh, so for regular for the backbone parameters. So I call it theta. I actually should call it w. But it's a uh, so how you update it. Let's say we're the optimizer. Really simple SGD without uh, momentum and weight decay. So the the you just use the last uh, last weight minus the learning rate times your the gradient times the gradient of the theta t. That's how you like. A, that's how you update every like a backbone network. Does slower yeah. mean a very small learning rate? What does slower mean? Yeah, it's a you okay. Oh, let, let me let me explain that. So let, let me first finish this thing. Okay, so for the momentum backbone parameter, what do you actually do is you do uh, every time every time the wait. Let me go with this one. Every time a theta t plus one changes, you just uh, you just uh, do this exponential moving average of the theta t of the theta t. The so basically the var theta var theta is a momentum backbone's parameter. So the var theta is an exponential moving average of the theta t. So when you set the m is a, like a really large, uh, like a like usually m is zero point nine nine or zero point nine nine six. So in this sense. You actually, you, you can, if you, you get time, you can try yourself. You can expand it. Actually, the learning rate, the in fact, the learning rate of the var theta t plus one is this, uh, is this uh, like, a, like a learning rate times one minus m. So when y minus m is 0 0.01, so basically this var theta's learning rate is like 100 times smaller than the learning rate of theta t. So it essentially kind of like have a smaller learning rate. Or on the other hand, it's just a, uh, other explanation. It's, it's, it, it, it is exponential moving average of a theta t. So it's a moving average. So every time it's a change really small. Like, a, yeah. So it sounds very counterintuitive. Uh, why should the momentum be set very high? Because you want the theta, to, to theta, t, uh, var theta t to be stable, right? If you set the momentum high, it will update will be really slow. Right. If, uh, if let's say let's say for example, if uh, in the extreme case, is m is just zero, if m is just zero, you cancel this one. So every time var theta t plus one is equa is equal to theta t plus one. In this case, the two network just uh, share the weight, basically like the same clear they share the weight. But when m is one, let's say the extreme case, the var theta t just the var, var theta t plus one, just var theta t. Basically, you do not change the weight. So Which is untrained, basically. It starts with it the basically untrained. untrained. Basically, random initialized. Keep it random, right? So, so by changing m between in zero, it means you the, the two weight, the backbone and the momentum backbone have the same weight. If you set m to one, means it is not trained at all. So by... M, by changing m between zero and one, you can you can change the rate of how how the var theta changes. So when you make m higher, so you actually slow down the changes of the var theta, right? So that's a. I I feel it's a pretty intuitive, uh, but uh, yeah, I may be wrong. 
Okay. All right. So I think. So, um, any question? Yeah. So Mike, I, I have a question. How many more slides do we have on contrastive techniques? That's all. I okay. Think. So I believe that should be pretty much it for today. Okay. Oh and yeah. I, I will check since the time. I for, Yeah. Well, hold on, hold on. Because I forgot to yeah. record. I forgot to record the introduction right today. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can say uh, we are done with the lesson if you if i mean you can say a few more things if you have to but uh, i would say the the lesson is ended and i will restart i mean i will re -re i will repeat myself the inter mm -hmm. uh, with the introduction of today's lesson such mm -hmm. that for whoever couldn't come to class they will have the uh, the first 10 10 minutes okay? Uh, okay so students don't have to stick around they can if you do want, if they want to ask questions uh, about the same question they asked before uh, mm -hmm. i will just tr do my best to try to remember what i said in the beginning part okay okay uh like uh, if we uh i don't think i have any else i think else to say but uh, if you have a question i can just answer on, in the chat okay so uh, alfredo can do your stuff you can do your stuff now yeah. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so class dismiss. Uh, free, you're free to go. We're going to be seeing judging again, of course, because this lesson was, I think, very good. I mean, I liked it a lot, especially the, the color theme, right? I think that was <laughs> very good. But okay, jokes aside, right? Uh, so we, we're going to be seeing judging again uh, very soon. Uh, and then we can keep going with the non-contrastive uh, techniques, right? And now I will just restart from beginning um, with the with whatever I forgot to record, right? That was my fault. And that was it. So again, thank you for being with us today. And sorry for forgetting to record the lesson. But never, nevertheless, we still have this post introduction of the whole lesson. Bye bye for whoever actually stick around. <laughs> Oh, okay. Someone actually did stick around. All right. So see, I fix it. I, even if I messed up, I fixed the thing. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.